Namibia, a vast, open, semi-desert country in sub-Sahara Africa, where you'll find challenging and unpredictable weather, experience rich and historical culture, and diverse wildlife and environments. This truly is... Stop. Stop, stop, stop. No, no, no. This is not how Into the Wild starts a film. Come on. Let's do it properly. One, two, three, go. How are you going? I'm Ryan, that dude right there. 32, Londoner, wildlife podcaster, nature enthusiast and professional dog walker. As early as I can recall, nature has been my focus, both learning about it and fighting to protect it. You know the type of kid, always outside looking for insects, always around animals, crying because I stepped on a snail, although that was only yesterday. What I'm trying to say is conservation and being kept up to date with it has been important to me for a long time. Trying to be informed, as people often say. So where does that lead me? Well, I used to think that based on everything I'd read, heard and watched, that I knew enough to make my mind up about a type of tourism called trophy hunting. I, like I'm sure many of you, hated it and wanted it gone. Kaput. Get in the sea, mate. But then one day in summer 2020, I had a chat with a UK conservation scientist who suddenly gave me information that debunked everything I'd ever learned. It quickly made me feel gross about feeling misinformed by wildlife NGOs and even wildlife presenters. So that was that. Next came the research. But damn is it hard to find reliable sources of info out there on this topic. It's either, trophy hunters are scum and should all die, or hunters save wildlife and they're all heroes. How the hell did I not notice something? The majority of the discussion is dominated by Western people, but the focus is always on Africa. So where are the African voices? After getting frustrated, confused and pissed off, I did what anyone else would do in that situation. Managed to get funding to head out to Namibia, a country well known to have a decent and grown muddle of trophy hunted so I could learn about it and these so-called benefits. OK, maybe that's not what anyone would do, but that's what me, Into the Wild's producer Oscar Henderson and Professor Adam Hart decided to do. So let's go. So we uh, we got to Namibia. Yeah. How, uh, how was it? Um, long. The short answer to your question, Oscar, is been horrible. I looked over and your head was in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you if I say we got 200 foot above that runway as we we're about to land. I'll film the crash. And the pilot just went no, this, and just took off again. And then about 10 minutes later, came over the tunnel. I went yes, sorry about that, everyone. Um, as you may have felt, there is a thunderstorm right at the runway. If you look out the left hand window, you can also see it. At this stage, it is not safe for us to continue and approach. We're like, okay, cool, she'll circle around, it'll go away. So, we're gonna have to go to Mount Airport um, because we're unable to land at Vintook because all four storms have merged to become one colossal storm over the airport. 
So that means in the space of three hours, we have a, we've visited three countries in Africa. Yeah, it's pretty wet here as well, isn't it? It's rained non-stop. Yeah. But, but we're, we're, here. Here. we're here in our lovely accommodation. As you see, I have my pajama bums, phone and pillows. What more could you need? And now we've got to go to sleep. We do, because we've got to be up at six. Yeah. After 18 hours of travelling, four beers, one pizza and five hours sleep, the first day had arrived for us in Windhoek, Namibia, where I was off to meet our guide for the trip and chief director of an organisation called NAXO, which stands for the Namibian Association for Community-Based Natural Resource Management Support Organisations. And this person was Maxi Lewis. We call them handing concessions in communal areas. And uh, so handing is actually helping communities to be able to have benefits uh, so that they can support their activities. Woo, it is warm. Hello, how you doing? Nice to see you. Please tell me it's air condenser. <laughs> this wasn't the first time I'd spoken to Maxi. I found her passion for community support admirable. Maxi originally came from a strict ecotourism route and thought hunting had no place in tourism or wildlife management. But after exploring her own country more, she found herself being challenged on those very points. So I guess, Maxi, it'd be good to know, can you tell us a bit about the history of Namibia and a bit about the history of the conservation of this country as well. Okay, so in terms of conservation, um, Namibia uh, has always been conserved, even during the apartheid system. Um, the conservation was something that uh, even the colonialists then also valued a, a lot. The only problem was, or the only challenge, that that conservation was not a shared vision with people on the communal areas. So they were excluded from, uh, from managing or owning or benefiting from their natural resources. So in 1990, when our government came in, the first thing was to include environment as part of, of, of their constitution, which was something remarkable. Mm. I think we were the first country to do so. And then from there on, we look at how can we replicate some of the conservation systems that were on what we call freehold land on communal land. And that's what we did in 1996 by amending a PACS bill to allow for local communities in rural areas to start participating in activities such as tourism and, and hunting. Namibia's colonial past is still very much felt today, but public ownership of natural resources may well be one way that Namibia has stepped away from that legacy. I'd like to know how that ownership has worked for conservation. In 1998, that's when we started uh, registering what we call our first communal conservancies. We had four pilots all over the country, and based on those pilots, we saw a lot of communities wanting to be part of the conservation model. So the model is known as the community-based natural resource model. Then there's activities within that model that is being implemented. So some of these activities are tourism activities, some of them are hunting, some of them deal with plants or trees or anything. So that's but involving communities, working very closely with government, also working very closely with uh, civil society organizations such as ours. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how the system then came into being um, in terms of what we are currently doing for conservation on those landscapes. Namibia is damn impressive when it comes to protecting its wild space. Over 45% of the country's land is protected or reserved to benefit wildlife and can be split into three main categories. National parks, private game reserves, which we'll come back onto later, and community conservancies and forestries. These conservancies are what Maxi and her organisation Naxo helped to oversee and are the main reason for why I'm here. The aim is to empower communities to benefit from the sustainable management and use of land resources, including wildlife. This could be through tourism activities like photography, safaris and lodges, or through own use, harvesting game meat or plant materials from community forests for building and crafts. And finally, what I'm hoping to find out more about, trophy hunting. This, enjoy this now for a couple of hours. <laughs> enjoy the enjoy what, 15 it. degrees we've got at the moment. <laughs> right, let's go. This was my first time in Southern Africa and I really had no idea what to expect. 
But what did surprise me was how quick it went from built-up city to wild open space. Now, Namibia is huge. I can't stress that enough. It covers over 800,000 square kilometers, which is over three United Kingdoms, or 19 Denmarks, if that's easier to imagine. So this trip, we're going up to several different conservancies. What, what do you think I'm going to learn? You, you need to understand, these people don't live in a fenced off area. They live with wildlife. And your takeaway is that, for me, will be there are people out there that make a living on these landscapes yeah. and then part of it also includes sustainable use mm. um, which is part of their livelihoods and also the dynamics for me on the landscapes and those type of information you will not get it from me you'll get it from them. Yeah, Driving around signs of wildlife was everywhere and the way it works in Namibia is when an animal like this kudu right here enters the land of a conservancy or private land it falls under the ownership of the land owner or local community. Do you think people will find it maybe a bit confusing or find it odd that I'm asking so much about just trophy hunting? They will find it strange that you are asking them, but for them, it's very normal. Uh, okay, it's a very really. normal occurrence that they do trophy hunting. It depends what is the questions that you are going to ask them about trophy hunting. Because if you ask them about, oh, do you do trophy hunts here? And what do you do with the meat? The usual questions that people ask, yeah. for them it's very normal. But if you ask them questions like, don't you think then they will like look at you very strangely. Really? Yes. Yeah. I'm now tempted to ask a question like that. I want oh, to see yes, the look. Oh yes, please just go ahead. <laughs> they will tell you, and they will look at you strangely. I mean, I'm six foot seven in Namibia. I'm going to get looked at strangely anyway, so I might as yeah, well that, ask the question. That's probably the first thing they will uh, look at. Is like, wow, this is strange. <laughs> <laughs> this tall guy. This tall guy. Yeah. Gonna... Yeah. Our trip was actually quite simple. We would drive to five conservancies, totaling over a thousand kilometres across Namibia each with different landscapes, needs, and tourism abilities. The first on our list, Seatsev Conservancy. Namibia is Africa's driest country, and during the time of our visit, the country was still going through an almost decade-long drought. 10 years with no substantial rain. I already knew this would bring great challenges to wildlife and people, so a good starting topic for me was to find out if trophy hunting could be sustainable with such a strong added pressure. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. This is quite exciting because this is my first chat. So do you want to just say, how long have you worked for the Conservancy? How, much, how long have you managed it here? Thank you very much and welcome, Ren. I have been in the community-based natural resource management program for more than 20 years. And as we've driven into this Conservancy today, and as I sit here now and look out, it's the habitat is quite, as I would describe, harsh. The area of us that we are living in, it's a semi-desert arid area. So normally we don't expect much rain in yeah. certain parts of the country. We have been experiencing the drought. We could see the change in the raining pattern a yeah. uh, number of the years. And then we could see now the climate change is really coming. Really? The drought is coming in. And wild, general wildlife populations within the Conservancy, how are they doing? Is there any trends or is, it, is everything kind of stable? Uh, in comparison with the past, yeah. You know, when the, when the rain was very good, you know, those times that you could see now the rain is falling even in this part of the of the conservancy, you could see the numbers, you mm -hmm. know. But as the drought is coming in, it, it, it reduced. So the other challenge that we're also having is in terms of, you know, the numbers can, can increase. And once the numbers increase, uh, you know, so many people here has got also interest in buying game meat. Yeah. And then the illegal activities start to come in. The reason, I mean, the main reason why I'm here and I'm meeting with people is to talk about trophy hunting um, and to try and understand more about it. Um, and trophy hunting used within this conservancy, uh, wildlife populations are down, should trophy hunting still go ahead? Let me say for argument's sake, if we see uh, the numbers of the oryx decreased, then we will not really allow to do hunting first and then to see how we can conserve and how we can protect these numbers for them to, to increase. Probably they are contributing factors. Oryx, uh, most of the meat people is, is, is in demand. Mm. So probably illegal hunting is a, is a key factor yeah. there. So those are the mechanisms that you have to look to see that's yeah. why it is decreasing. Eric puts it simply, there are many other issues at play for wildlife. At the end of the day, I've come here to talk about a single factor regarding Namibian wildlife, but really that's not possible. I have to learn about other factors too. In communal conservancies, trophy hunting's impact is managed by the use of quotas. So I wanted to talk to SeatSeb staff about how they felt about trophy hunting's current restrictions and the use of these quotas. The issue of the issue, but, uh, because it's not only the trophy hunting that is 
uh, in decreasing the population of uh, wildlife. It's also my mitigation of wildlife uh, to another area, mm. maybe because of drought or like my manager said, poaching also. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not actually bad also, but because when, when we are doing the trophy handings, we are only uh, handing the implemented mm. things, yeah. uh, and then we are handing it according to the rules and the regulations yeah. of the yellow book also. So the regulation yeah. for you is, 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 is that a good quality for trophy hunting? Yes. Yeah. I would, all I would add, add is um, we should like uh, have a show of thing as to how the trophy hunting is maybe taking place. Mm, okay. And then letting them understand as to how we are doing it. To show it more of the process. Yes. Yeah, that's, and that's that amazing. And maybe educate also. We learn from there and then see that it's not actually a bad thing to do. Seeing is believing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing is, is believing it also. The mindset of the many people has also changed. People start to sense their ownership over the things. So you can mm. talk to them and say, how are you going to support Namibian police? How are you going to support farmers? How are you going to support And then you make it as an uh, integrated, holistic type of a conservation effort that you are doing. And probably also to see. An integrated and holistic approach to wildlife conservation? Oh, I like that idea. That feels proper and solid for any country. But for now, it was back in the car for a two hour drive to our next conservancy, Soros Soros. And I was about to learn a life in Namibia lesson pretty quick. And that was, the weather can change hard and fast. From 37 degrees Celsius to skies as moody as Kristen Stewart in twilight. Now I've seen monsoons before, but I'd never seen rain like this. Unfortunately, it stopped us in our tracks, making us fall behind for our visit to Soros Soros and meaning we only had time for a quick stop. With such little time at Soros Soros, I wanted to get straight to the important question. What benefits does trophy hunting bring in? Most of our community are unemployed mm. and people of out of fortune. They had less privilege to attend schools. So uh, with that certain amount we are getting from trophy hunting, we pay school fees, school wow. bursaries, and for the meat we give it as a benefit distribution. Mm. For some occasions like funerals, weddings, even to the boarding school, mm. for the hostel, for the kids to be fit. Wow, so there's a lot of benefits that come through to the yeah. Conservancy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's much benefit that comes to the Conservancy from trophy hunting. Uh, the one thing that we didn't pack was rain jackets. Did you pack your rain jacket? Nope. <laughs> so far, we've seen a lot of rain. <laughs> Go on. Go on. <laughs> we had to be up at sunrise with a quick coffee and then off to our next stop. Today, I was absolutely buzzing because I was getting a tour of black rhino habitat. Maxie had arranged us to meet Simpson, who is a Tusk Award winner for efforts in conservation. So we've just got in the car with uh, this lovely gentleman here called Simpson, from, who's a director of Save the Rhino Trust. Thank you for taking us on this trip today. You're, You're welcome. welcome. <laughs> Um, and how long have you been the director of Save the Rhino Trust? Um, you know, I, I started with Save the Rhino Trust 30 years ago. Yeah. A common sight in the trophy hunting debate is hunters sat on well-known species such as rhino, which is controversial due to their status, especially black rhino being critically endangered. But Namibia has become a stronghold for the species and has the largest free-roaming population in Africa. Simpson was taking us well out into the wilderness of the Toro Conservancy, a two-and-a-half-hour drive right into the African bush, and wildlife was everywhere. Even the elusive desert elephants made an appearance for us. But I wanted to talk to Simpson about black rhinos in Namibia and how trophy hunting works for the species. 
Oh, that was quite a drive on those roads. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite rough. It's rough. Right? It's, it's rough. Rocks all over. I mean, when you come around the hill, you don't know. I mean, it's just rocks. Where is the road going now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In every corner, I was like, I don't know where we're going, but it looks amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. It changes. I mean, it, it changes every now and then. The scenery just changes, you know. And this area we're in now, um, so where have we come to? What is this area? This, this area is actually called the Poachers Camp area. Mm. You know, as you can see here, there is a... A big spring, not not a big spring, but it's 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 big. It's I mean, still here. Because, yeah, yeah. And it's I mean, for the past thirty years that I've been here around, I haven't seen it drying out. I mean, wow. There is water always, so it attracts all the wildlife from this area here to come here. And in the old days, I mean, the guys, um, the white farmers that was here used this area for hunting, actually, but it was illegal, so it was poaching. So poaching. Yeah, and that's why we call this place uh, Poacher's Camp. I mean, okay. We had a good con concentration of rhinos in this area. As I told you, we also lost two in a well there. Mm. Um, uh, but I still, it's, 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 it's a very nice place. I mean, yeah. if it's raining, it's quite green. Food is close by, water is close by. The rhinos just come in, go up the hills, browse and come and have water. I guess with poaching as well, something I, I, I guess I, got, I, I had to learn this myself only a couple of years ago is that trophy hunting is different to poaching, but, uh, but a lot of people in Europe and UK kind of see it as the same thing, but how are they different? They are different. I mean, trophy hunting, you choose the animal that you want to shoot. And we mostly focus on big un, uh, unproductive wolves with uh, big horns and sometimes females, all females. Yeah. That's what we focus on. But the hunter will just come in and with my experience in, in rhinos over yeah. the past years with poaching, every single case where there was a poaching, we lost two rhinos. It's a cow and a calf. Right. They, they shot the calf, a little calf without horns even. So poaching and hunting is two different things. Let's talk stats to explain the impact of trophy hunting versus poaching on rhino in Namibia. In the last decade, a total of 12 rhino were used as trophies. But in the last two years, there have already been 105 cases of poached rhino in Namibia. That's almost 10 times the trophies, but in a quarter of the time. Something I hear a lot and I, I've always questioned is people say, with trophy hunting, they always take the big and the best, but that can't be no, the way it works. No, it, it's, it, I mean, if it's big and it's still productive, you don't kill it. You yeah. keep it because, I mean, that's, that's a big breeding bull. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, like with elephants, I mean, it, it will be a big bull, but he's, he's still productive and he's still... So you don't want to kill him. Mm. You don't want to kill the population. Yeah, The absolutely. same with the rhinos. I mean, even if it's a big bull and he is still productive, you see he is he's productive in the population, then yeah. you don't do that. Do you go on the hunts with trophy hunting? Um, no, I, 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 I haven't been. I mean, there was only one case in, in the region, but I haven't been to, yep. and um, I don't think I want to. <laughs> I don't I think, think I, I understand that. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think but I can a... go and show a guy, okay, yeah. that's it, and then yeah. I will go for hunting on an antelope or something like that. But you but couldn't with right. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, prefer yeah, not no, to with so. rhino. So, in Namibia, what are the rhino populations like and how have they changed over the years? I mean, we start, especially in the northwest, mm. we start very low with mm. plus 60 animals. And over the years, we have been as far as 200 plus animals. Wow. And, and now we are between 100 and 200. We flux there. And, you know, it, we had, as you can see, we had a very big drought for the yeah. past eight years. Mm. And we had a very minimal survival of calves. Uh, but I, as you said yesterday, you guys must have bring the rain and we received... <laughs> oh, we witnessed the rain. <laughs> yes, we received, I mean, big rain. Maybe it was like half a day, the complete rain, rain that we get for the year. And I was like, wow, I think we will make it this year, yeah. the newcomers. For the, the rhinos in our area, I mean, if it rains, they really pop. And do you think the rhinos increase and the success of that would have been able to happen if trophy hunting had been taken away with no replacement all those years ago? Um, you know, trophy hunting in Namibia, we, we had one animal a year, I think, or five animals, I think. It hasn't impacted the population at all. No. I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. Do you think it's um, impacted the success of the conservation? Yeah, conservation. it has. I mean, yeah. when, it, when it comes to other, other trophy hunted animals like elephants, 
mm. antelopes and things. I mean, the conserv conservancy was way well off. I mean, yeah. it's it's a big benefit. Trophy hunting is beneficial to the people. I mean, yeah, that I will say it. I think that, that that's almost the full stop sentence, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no matter and, who I talk to, it's going to be. And the thing is, you had really control over your wildlife. Yeah. If I mean the quotas are given out right, and if the numbers, if the game counts are right, and you do the right thing, trophy hunting or hunting is really not a big problem. And let's look at the wildlife or the animal NGOs in the UK that are trying to ban trophy hunting. Um, that advised our government very recently mm. on our animal abroad bill. If you had them here now and they said we want to ban it, what what would you say to them? All I will say to them is replace the funding and let's leave the animals to be there to survive. But we can get the money to do the work. Because, I mean, to have so many animals on your land and if you can't control them mm. one or other time, I mean, you, you actually damage the population. Yeah. And I mean, the only thing I can say here is if those people can give them money to protect these animals, to keep the poachers away, to make the youth aware of what we had and the benefits and also um, the sustainability, yeah. then I would say it's fine. I'm not going to sound biased, but I don't think they have the money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why we want to be sustainable yeah, and do yeah. it on the ground where yeah. we had it. And we don't have to go and really yeah. ask somebody sense. that don't have money. That makes sense. Yeah. Sounds simple when you hear it like that, right? Want trophy hunting to stop? Then replace the income. Since filming this, Namibia saw the poaching of 22 black rhino. It's a very real problem, and one that needs policing, but that costs money. surprised you about the last couple of days? Um, I think I've said it a couple of times now, but it's just the sheer size of Namibia. <laughs> I'm literally driving across land for two hours at a time and just going past, and I don't mean this to sound in a boring way, but the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. And then when you find out that's just wild land, I've, I've never done that in a country before. I've never had that chance to drive past wilderness. And also seeing like, signs that wildlife have been, I think that's been the most surprising part so far. Today, driving with Simpson around Torres Conservancy or around that region, we were walking around in bits that were elevated so you could really see to the end of the horizon. And he's like, yeah, this is all, we have to conserve all this. And it was just like that jaw dropping moment of like, I thought I was busy. <laughs> You've got all this to conserve. I think that's a bit that surprised me most so far. Another night of storms and another night of Namibian people saying, oh, look, it's the British band who brought the rain. But we were up bright and early and to quote Willie Nelson, on the road again. Now, something I feel isn't discussed enough is how we expect people to simply coexist with wildlife that we want to save. In our next conservancy, Cody House, Wildlife populations hit an all-time low in the 1990s due to human-wildlife conflict. However, in 1998, when Cody House was registered, wildlife populations grew and stabilised. Unfortunately, so did human-wildlife conflict. In fact, they grew sixfold in 2001 to 2010. But a way around this? Turn wildlife from a problem into a solution. If people can use wildlife to draw in tourists, including trophy hunting, they will benefit from the income and therefore value wildlife and its presence. I'm Fabiano. I was been born in this area, which is called Twadid Pass Conservancy. Now I'm serving 10 years. 10 years here? Yeah, at wow. the committee. So being born and raised here, you must have a big passion. Like you must love this. I love it, I love it. Do you hear much kind of um, wildlife conflict issues? Do they come up much for yeah. people? Like this past three years, mm. we did have a severe drought. The whole Kunene, we didn't have rain. So. What happens there is uh, we do have human wildlife conflict because the, the predators increase and the livestock decrease. Because uh, when the animal dies, 
the predators can consume it. The, our community, what they do is, they keep their livestock to pay the school fees and to buy food for yeah. themselves. But if a lion comes to your farm and destroys your livestock, people get very, very angry. Lions, they are a problem. They are a problem in the area? Mm, they are a problem, but nowadays they are quiet because it's raining. Mm. You know, it's raining season, they are now, they are quiet. But they are a problem. Old lions, old leopards, they like to come for easy prey. Then they will jump into the crowds, kill the, uh, the livestock of the people, and you are not having money. Either you have to sell those lands, and you have, if you have money, then you can pay the community for their loss. If you take out of the trophy hunting, mm. the wildlife will increase, and human wildlife conflict will increase. Right. Because if you have, like, if you have an old lion, which is a trophy lion, if you don't take it off, that lion, it will be very impossible for him to get a zebra. The easiest prey will be a cow. So he will go for the cow and then right. the human wildlife conflict will increase. Right. Yeah, so that type of scenario. So trophy hunting for us, it generates generate money and it also gives a benefit as a meat to the community. Mm. So it also balances, balances. our life. Yes. Our, okay. our wildlife. So it is a case of stopping the conflict really, because the conflict is where also we start to lose the wildlife yes. if it goes down and it's more uh, unregulated, I guess. Yeah. We do have a lot of elephants because People living in Europe or overseas, they say we must protect and nobody doesn't have a right to shoot it. But now, in our area, in one night, you can see 90 up to 150 elephants. And these wow. elephants usually destroy infrastructures, gardens, all this stuff. And the same community is requesting for the government, please, these animals have increased. Could you please minimize them? We don't say it, just take them all, all the elephants, yeah. but please minimize them to, to, so that we can have manageable numbers. We love our animals. We like, we like conserv conservation. So we want to be with the elephants on the sustainable way. Let me say, uh, if the old elephant bull died, just died, so you know the value of that elephant bull. You cannot just waste the money like that. Either you must sell him and get money and save the community. You've now worked in this area in the Conservancy for 10 years. Mm. You must love wildlife. I do. And it, how, how big of a part has wildlife played in your life? Like me, myself, when I grew up, uh, if I saw a kutu in those years, I could just say, I have, this is the meat I have to eat. But with this conservation, I have changed because this same kudu can give me something back through photographic tourism. Yeah. So that's why I have to protect it so that my generations can also see it. And if, in the same time, even more people can get job. So in the past, people would say, okay, this kudu, we have to eat it. But now the, this scenario has changed. So the animal has gone from a single source yeah. to now a multiple source yeah. from um, just a enjoying to see to uh, potential investment income as well. Yes. Um, and is that down to conservancies having ownership of the wildlife? Yes. And the managing? Yeah. And obviously, you, I guess some people in England and Europe may be confused with that and say, then why does trophy hunting happen? If, if, if we love the wildlife, then why do we trophy hunt? How would you answer that? The money generated from the trophy hunting it comes to the conservancy and, and then we, we gave back to the community mm. and it also created jobs. So the money, which he, the salary and the food rations which he got, it will go to more 10 to 20 people back to, in the community. So it feeds right back yeah, down. So that, that's very much important. What would your reply be to organisations in England that are trying to ban trophy hunting and get rid of it? If you could stand there and look at them and say something, what would you say? At my simple view, I could have said they could not ban trophy hunting, but uh, they have to give us provisions like what they are doing. Okay, if you have 10 kudus, mm -hmm. okay, keep eight and take two. That will be advisable for us. Yeah. But if you say no, I automatically know that put off trophy hunting, human wildlife conflict will increase. Yeah. Yeah. So it puts it more at risk. Yeah. And that's a reason. It's a risk, so, yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic, Fabio. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's really nice. The minute, I hope the minutes get easier as well. <laughs> Being from England, it's hard to wrap my tea drinking, Yorkshire pudding eating, all weather hating head around selling animals like lions or elephants off to be hunted. But the people I spoke to here made it crystal. If we're to expect people to live alongside these animals and to tolerate conflicts, then they need to see their lives as a priority on the landscape too. Back in the car, I wanted to hear Maxie's take on this. For me, it's an issue of, of respecting each other as humans first, you know. So if you live in Europe, there are certain things as a human beings that you want to have, you know, around yeah. you so that you have a comfortable life. So why would you like them to look after wildlife in a different way and you want to live in in, in your way, in your way yeah. uh, making your decisions on their behalf? We, we, we understand that wildlife be, belong to the world, that uh, we, we also need to understand in what circumstances these people live. It's not easy to live with wildlife. These animals are wild. You hear it from my stories, they destroy people's livelihood. Yeah. They kill people. So just imagine if we put you exactly in the same scenario. Uh, I'm sure you will also have exactly the same outcry. I would imagine. So. Yeah, so it's exactly yeah. the same issue. So I think we need each other. Um, yeah. The concerns are genuine and we do appreciate those concerns, but uh, we should also not uh, uh, act very naively thinking that, you know, um, yeah, they are humans, they should be living with, with wildlife. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Yeah, so, it's, it's, a, it's a mark of respect. Yeah, it's just, it's just an issue of respect. Yeah. It's just respecting each other mm -hmm. and try to come around and and then talk to each other and see how we can resolve these problems if we want to save these species. Mm. No? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Remember earlier when I said we'd come back to discussing private communal land? Well, here we are at Enduri Lodge a piece of private communal land just outside of Atosha National Park, a place used for photo and hunting tourism as well as a cattle ranch. Private communal land means there's a mutual agreement with other landowners in the area. My aim here was to learn how this place worked in comparison to the conservancy model. To do this, we stayed with, spoke with and learnt from the owners, Cindy and Helmut Bossoff. All right, I'm Cindy Bossoff um, from Namibia. This is my husband. Say your name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Boss of, uh, uh, currently in Namibia. The size of their land was mind-blowing. Even on the drive up to the lodges, we saw it was open, green, and full of wildlife of all types, from springbok, wildebeest, warthog, waterbuck, waterbirds, and insects of many kinds. How the hell did two people on their team manage a place like this? I was pumped to learn more. I um, initially came to Namibia from Cape Town. Um, at that stage, born and raised in the city, had no idea what any of this was about. I was extremely anti-hunting, um, anti-killing anything, anti-you can mention everything. It was just, no. In the growing up here, we would get lo not really lost, but my, you know, dis disappear from especially the, the, the parents trying to just do our thing and and you learn to love nature you learn to see things differently you we have a different perspective of what nature is to the let's call it the the city folk it's a living being it's a, it, it really is a special place if you understand it what is the main driving force of Anjuri Lodge in regards to funding if, if it comes to the finances of things if you put everything, let's put it in thirds, as we have the cattle industry, the tourism industry, and the hunting industry, yeah. I think two thirds would be the hunting. Two thirds? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 I mean, the, the, the trophy hunter brings into Africa more money, although they are the, by far the least tourists, but the amount of money that they do spend doing a safari is so much more than the average person just traveling through the country. That's a good point that Helmut just made, and one that I didn't even consider. Is each trophy hunter bringing in more money per person 
compared to groups of people for photo tourism? Okay, well here's the deal. That data ain't available for Namibia. But a similar study was done for Timbavati in South Africa that concluded that 21,000 photographic tourists brought in 51% of tourism revenue, while only 21 trophy hunters brought in 30%. Maybe the same could be for Namibia? And when we're looking at the climate crisis and air travel, kind of makes you think. When my dad bought this specific property, the previous owner was a cattle rancher. He had to sell because he was a cattle rancher. He couldn't make it anymore. Wow. There was no game on this property or hardly any. The reason was the game animals, they, they interfere with the, with, the, with the ranching. I mean, they, obviously they compete with grazing. They compete with water sources. So the, the farmer or the, the, the person that has to make some kind of a living off of the land can't have game if they can't utilize the source. Mm. Um, so then when we started the, the hunting industry and not the tourism industry, we did have to have ample numbers of games. So yeah. what did we have to do? We had to create this environment. We had to create this sanctuary for wildlife and make it as, as natural as possible for them to want to be here. So if you think about the hunting aspect, and what it's done for the animals, just on my place. I mean, we had a couple of gemsbuck running around here and the odd kudu when we started. Now we have reintroduced eland, uh, we have reintroduced, oh, I mean, everything from blue wildebeest, black wildebeest, um, uh, impala, zebra, impala. springbucks, uh, everything we had to reintroduce. Those animals originally were here, but they were extinct, actually. Um, but because of the demand for the for the animal for the hunting, um, we reintroduced them. I mean, this is now 20 years ago, so they're doing pretty good now. Um, but talking about what would happen to the animals, that I mean, that in itself will explain it. Take yeah. take away the hunter, and you are taking away the caretaker. Yeah, Just to put it into a, an an average person's perspective, forget about animals. So you own a hotel in the Seychelles. And they tell you, we will supplement your income. You don't need to run your hotel anymore. Are you going to keep up maintenance? No. Exactly. It's hundreds of thousands of US dollars we spend per year um, just maintaining the farm. I mean, just the maintenance. And I mean, you wouldn't do that if you didn't need to. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of work. I've heard from you both. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of varied work as yes. well. <laughs> Whilst at Anduri Lodge, we were able to freely explore it over the two days we racked up a decent species spot list. I still don't get what makes people want to come here and shoot things, but the fact is, wildlife is only here because they do. It made me think about places back home in England. Does our wildlife currently have enough value to make people want it to flourish? Or does value need more focus when discussing ways to rewild areas? We are not quoted. We we can decide ourselves, and that comes down to management. Um, if you're a bad manager, you're gonna run out of game, and then you want to have clients, and then so therefore the whole ripple effect. Um, but actually the government has a sort of a system in place. For every trophy hunting client that I receive, I can get a, or have to apply for a trophy hunting permit. Mm. On that permit, every client is issued, depending on the site status, two species or one species or none, depending on how many I have shot for the year. Okay. So it is regulated to a certain extent by the government as well, which I think is a good thing. I yeah. mean, you can't just over-utilize over the area. Your trophy hunter is not allowed to just go out there and do whatever he likes to. He's got a, um, he has a, a registered PH, a professional hunter with him at all times. And that professional hunter tells him that this is a good animal to take down you are allowed to take the shot. Until right. your pH does not tell you that, you don't, you don't do anything. So there is a lot on, in the background that a lot of people don't realize about when it gets to, to that side of things. For ourselves on our property, we've got 500 or 600 gemsbuck and 500 or 600 eland at the moment. So for me to say, well, I'm gonna harvest 10 eland during the course of the next year with the trophy hunters, 
if I've got 600 cows, you can imagine I'm kind of having like 500 calves every year. So by harvesting just 10, you can see how this is going to multiply and grow. So you have to manage these animals' numbers because otherwise they are going to eat themselves to death. It's, it's a difficult one to, to really get somebody's mind wrapped around the fact that I'm killing something to benefit the rest. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but that is the fact. Yeah. I mean, uh, as like we talked last night, we had that terrible drought in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, we, I actually I had the toughest year of my life that year because I had to decrease my game population by about 50%. Now, the only way possible for that is you have to shoot them. Now, most people would go around and say, well, they will die in any way, or they're busy dying, how could you shoot them? But for me, to take out 50% of my species meant that the other 50% could survive. Yeah. If I didn't do that, all of them would have died. So therefore, being inhumane, I was actually humane. And that's the concept that people do not understand. It's The bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's kind of a, th uh, a thing of giving people ownership of wildlife to benefit from it is the way yes, forward yes. Um, and how that works best. And, in that and, and again, if you, if you look at the system we have in Namibia, I mean, we are a, a model for the world of what wildlife management should be like. Mm. Um, if you look at, like you were asking earlier about our concessions, yeah. um, in my opinion, they are mismanaged but they are still managed better than some of the best states in, in, in Europe or in America. In England. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, are really, they are really well managed. Obviously, there's things that you would want to change, but you have to understand it is a government entity. Yeah. Um, Cindy Helmet, thank you so much for, well, A, a let me be here <laughs> and seeing your <laughs> amazing property, and thanks so much for talking with me. Thank you. Pleasure. It was time for us to leave on Dury Lodge and time for once again Ryan to be the one that opened the gate. Seriously, it was always Ryan's turn. I've only got little arms. On the drive to our last conservancy, I had some Ryan pondering time. Sup, how you doing? Sorry to interrupt the film, I know you're enjoying it, but we'll get back to that in just a couple of minutes. But first of all, there's something I'd like to say before we get onto our last conservancy. Now, since getting back from Namibia, I've noticed one thing. I've discussed this topic so much with so many different people, but the thing that keeps popping up is no matter who we talk to, what we hear, we in the Western world always seem to manage to divert our attention away from what's being said and focus it on our own emotion. For example, watch this. I don't need to ask you because obviously we do appreciate obviously the conservation side of things and obviously with the financial for locals with mm. meat and things like that. What about these rich people that fly over there, pay £50,000 to go and get a trophy? What's your view on that? Well, it's a very... Add that to the fact that our government seems to be way more focused on their reputation in banning trophy hunting imports into this country rather than the reasons for doing so and the potential consequences. In many ways, the UK has led the agenda on wildlife protection. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that we would enhance that reputation if, like France, the Netherlands and Australia, we banned the import of so-called hunting trophies? And the last yeah. bit, the bit that really upsets me, is that sometimes, once it's all laid out on the table, we simply just refuse to believe people. Uh, we really refute claims by trophy hunters that uh, the fees that they pay um, uh, significantly uh, help uh, wildlife conservation uh, or local communities. The evidence for their claims really doesn't stack up when you look at it um, overall. Some wildlife NGOs dispute the claim that trophy hunting is a vital source of income to certain communities and that it is a valid method of conservation. If we look at the planet as a whole, or even just the continent of Africa, then there is some truth in this. In many places, trophy hunting is just one portion of an income with photo tourism and lodges sometimes making up a larger percentage. However, that ain't applicable everywhere and some conservancies in Namibia rely almost entirely on trophy hunting to get by. Government blanket bans on trophy hunting or trophy imports could critically risk overlooking rural communities where large scale and reliable alternative tourism just isn't an option. I travelled to the Eri Rover Puka Conservancy on the edge of Atosha National Park. Here I spoke with community members and conservancy staff about the economic benefits they receive 
and what the impacts would be if hunting tourism was removed. So thank you, Sigrid, for meeting to chat with me. How long have you worked here for the Conservancy? Yeah, my name is Sigrid Meunjumubuma. I'm a chairperson of Aero Ibuka Conservancy. So I've been working for, I've been a chairperson for the Conservancy for nine years. How do you finance and make the money here at the Conservancy? What different methods do you use to make money here? We, we do have a different uh, methods of getting income to the conservancies. Normally, trophy hunting mm. is that is the most important. Wow. And then the other one is uh, the, the lodges. Mm. We need to build lodges so that we can have tourism for the lodge to get the income. But for now, our conservancy, for now, we are trying to get now lodges for the conservancy. For now, we don't have a lodge in our conservancy. The only source of income that we got is only now trophy hunting. That's your That's only source, of, source income. of income. Wow. What we have in the conservancy. Wow. With trophy hunting being Eri Rotherpooka's only source of tourism income, I couldn't help but think of the youth and their future here. I wondered how they feel about countries elsewhere putting their future at risk. Okay. I'm Kai Deri. Waroa is my surname, a lady from Namibia. Thank you so much for meeting me to talk. Um, I'd like to ask, first of all, how long have you lived in this area? Have you always lived here? Yes, I grew up here. I was born here and since my childhood. Yeah, until here, I'm now 22 years, meaning to say I've been here for 22 years. 22 years. Yes. And for the youth in this conservancy, what benefits do they receive from the conservancy? Oh, the youth actually receive money from it, especially when you are going to study. Mm. We come back to the conservancy. Wow. So as we are receiving visitors, it's when we are getting money. Uh, so we, are, we came here, you want to go study further, you don't have money, you just come to the conservancy. As they received more uh, uh, foreigners, that's when they gain money now. Mm. So if they receive foreigners, then you will get enough money for your studies. So if they don't, then we get nothing no to, go, yeah, to go far for our education. Trophy hunting, would you like to see that go, change or stay? As it is. I just want it to grow. To grow? Yes. Because uh, trophy hunters, it's, this is where we mostly get money from. Mm. So, like, especially uh, from abroad, those mm. people sometimes they don't have animals that we have here. So, especially those, those are the only animals that are attracting our visitors, right? Yeah. So, our, our country is also gaining money, right? So, what we are talking about, it's just money from our animals. So without money, we are going nowhere. So we just need foreigners. Without animals, foreigners are not coming anymore. So am I right in saying that if it was taken away from this conservancy, that would mean a very bad thing? I, that's why you see I'm just quiet for a while, mm. because uh, if you talk about taking away hunting, it's like you are saying you are killing us. Wow. So that's why we also want to eat. Yeah. maybe lodges. Yes. And now, if you want to say, no, you want to take this, what we are struggling with it, now what will be there? Does it seem silly when you hear people in my country, in England, that want to ban trophy hunting? Do you think that sounds silly or do you think that's quite normal? So, because that's now the way of taking bread out of our mouth. Yeah? So, as I said that, if we get you those people that are coming from abroad, that's when we get money, right? Yeah. So if now the trophy hunting is no more, then life is no more in Namibia. Yeah. Since we are living from those people that are coming from abroad. And would you, is there anything you would like, I, I guess, to give you an opportunity if the people or any big organisations in England were here now, the people that want to stop it? What would you directly say to them if you had that chance? They won't. I'll fight back. They should not. If you fight back as the youth, we should grow. Mm -hmm. We also have to create something for our conservancy to grow. Yeah. Now, if you take it away, where are we going? Yeah. Wow. We're going nowhere. So okay. I cannot allow that to happen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. you. Yeah. That's brilliant.
questions I've asked people, have, they've not found weird, but also they're just telling me about their normal life. I hope the easiest thing is just showing that you can't take something away from someone that they need without replacing it. Listening to the, the people that I've met from farmers, from conservancy managers, from organisations, CEOs, um, that they've all said the same thing of that you, sure, if you don't want us to do this, please help us replace it or please replace it yourself. So I think that's, I, I hope at the end of this is that that's going to be so clear and that people are going to understand that. I think the thing that's going to be hardest <laughs> is just to understand, or for people to understand that they just need to accept it. I think we all have a challenge and that challenge is that we would like to make sure that we save species in the world. But to save those species, we have to make sure that there is a, an understanding between us as, as people from different countries and make sure that there's alternatives for those who live with white lives. If those who live with white life don't have alternatives, then we might have a problem on our hand that our species are going to disappear as fast. We know that we have different approaches, but we need to make sure that we probably talk to each other around these approaches and come up with really meaningful alternatives that will benefit not just wildlife, but benefit both the habitat for wildlife and also people's livelihoods. I think that's for me, I see this as a is a real opportunity out there between the two groups that feel that, for instance, trophy hunting is not the way to go. And I guess my last question is, a score out of 10, what did you make out of Oscar's dancing earlier today? 10 out of 10. <laughs> yes! Yeah. 10 out of 10. The guy was just so good, I tell you. can you see the way he's moving? And he is continuing. <laughs>